So federated cloud applications, that to me is another interesting architectural model. Uh, we've seen hybrid clouds. We've seen distributed systems across clouds um, to various extent, both in terms of distributing components or, or utilizing cloud balancing or cloud bursting. Or uh, Those are classic models in terms of how we can leverage infrastructure. But tell us in your own words about what a federated cloud application is in terms of how you've defined it, in terms of how you see this also affecting the evolution of not just cloud computing, but distributed application design. Yeah, and obviously it's an old concept, it's been around for a long time. We've been doing federated distributed applications, you know, it's my career since the 80s. Um, and so there's a reason that you use it. But the idea would be within a cloud world, they were able to run aspects or portion of an application on different physical cloud providers based on the needs of the application. So for example, we may have an application that leverages a big data system, a transactional database, an AI-based system that it uses to analyze both, both of those databases and a core perform uh, core high speed transactional processing system and decision support system that are aspects of this key application that runs our business as an instance of it. Well, it may make sense to run those things on a single cloud provider, but in many instances it's not because we're going to find that we need this particular AI capability on this cloud provider, this big data system on this cloud provider, this transactional database on this cloud provider and may end up with three or four different cloud providers that we would have kind of as the dream team for our applications, for lack of a better word. So the idea is that there's going to be some trade-off in terms of we're building complexity into itself because we're putting different aspects and different components that are running on different cloud providers, but there may be a core business benefit in making that happen. Right now, I would look, I would take a, uh, a very close look at someone who presented that to me as a solution. I'd look at the business capabilities of doing it and the reasons for doing it um, because you're getting into some additional costs um, there's a feder there, I call it the federated application development tax, which is like the container tax, more money to build these things and deploy them and some additional risk and some also some additional um, uh, fragility uh, that can come into the architecture. If the database goes down because AWS is out for an hour, that's going to stop everything from processing typically. Mm -hmm. So barring that, we've gone through that analysis. It may make sense from a business perspective to put aspects of various applications on different physical cloud providers for different reasons, whether it's cost, innovation, uh, capabilities, best of breed capabilities, things like that. So the cool thing about building, like we talked about the meta cloud, and this is kind of how to come together, it allows us to monitor and manage those things. Again, using abstraction automation, we're able to build these systems in a centralized layer, at least logically, even though they physically exist on different systems and kind of run them as a single logical application that runs on different heterogeneous cloud environments. So I see that moving forward in terms of the fact that we're going to become very picky about where we run our applications on the different cloud providers that have different set of costs, different performance capabilities, and you know different set of security capabilities that we're going to be insistent upon. And in many instances, those are going to be the same cloud as they move forward. And more often than not, they're going to be different cloud providers that provide the opt completely optimized solution for making that happen. So that's kind of federated application development. It's kind of open, opening up your mind to run different application components on different physical uh, infrastructure, cloud infrastructure, for example, and manage it through the same logical layer. And again, you can get to different scalability, cost effectivity, and actually get to a, a cloud architecture and application architecture that could be something that's near optimized. So we're not making trade-offs. We're saying, well, yeah, I know I'm using this database on, on uh, this particular cloud provider, but also running my application there. I want the data to be close to the databases, uh, application to be close to databases I can, but this database not very good. And therefore it's gonna be, you know, maybe 50% optimized based on what I need in the system versus this other database that is optimized. Um, that I would like to use, well, this would be why not use that database and why not use that other application component and why not use other containerization? So that's kind of heterogeneous distri federated distribution. The other thing we're moving up to is this kind of this idea of uh, portable containerization that's able to run across various platforms. Um, and years ago, I wrote a, a paper that was way out there, and I look at it now. I talk about autonomous, um, autonomous self-relocating containers 
uh, for fully scalable application. And that's where you basically launch containers into a pool, very much like Kubernetes, I guess, that was I was thinking at the time. I don't think Kubernetes was around, by the way. And it would automatically find its best place to run by having a container that can run in uh, several different locations and run the same way, but it would make an assessment as to where it should be running based on the properties of the container, almost like what a serverless system does. It looks at the behaviors of the particular application and it allocates the number of services and memory needed to support that particular application. But this one way, way would be we have submit this to some sort of an abstraction layer it would automatically self-migrate the containers, the data, to the particular platform where it was optimized and running on. And so the key for that is, okay, well, that's going to make things overly complex and take contr- and give control to an automated system versus human beings. But I think that's what you want. If we have an AI-based system, which is looking at the different resources and looking at the cost of the resources, and it's able to run those resources or run that application on these resources in a fully optimized or nearly fully optimized state, And it's able to save $100,000 a month. Why not? Why would we want to do that? And it's able to not give up scalability because aspects of it would be also BCDR capabilities where it's running replicated containers on another cloud provider. So if one container uh, does go down on a cloud provider, the other one can fail over and take over via the container. It can basically go back to the mothership, tell it that something's going wrong with this resource and relaunch a container on another platform that happens to be running. And really, it doesn't matter where the, the containers and where the databases exist. Everything is allowed, uh, is going to be able to find each other and leverage each other in a, in a better sequential path. I, I just can't help but thinking that that's where we're heading with this. Obviously, when people will put their head down on the table now when I start talking about this, um, and the reality is it's hard enough just building a, a distributed system and building an application on the cloud, let alone you know, having multiple cloud providers and having completely portable and autonomous containers are able to relo- self-relocate from different platforms. But if we're getting into this meta cloud environment, we're getting into centralization and abstraction in these various systems, those systems, those cloud providers become resources unto itself. And there's no reason we can't manage the resources on our terms, even running containers and applications, whether they're localized or native to a particular system or they're in a container, they're able to run anywhere. And I think that provides the power into the architect, the application provider, sorry, the application architect in building these systems. I mean, far too often, I mean, I'm sure you've been an application architect and I've held that role, uh, role when I was younger. It used to drive me nuts that I was limited to the capabilities of the particular platform I was assigned to. And, there, and why couldn't I leverage another platform as needed and even do so in a way in op- some sort of an operational state where I'm able to move this workload up, up, over to this other platform if it makes sense in the life cycle of the workload to make it happen. Really kind of asking us those questions. Now, what's going to move us there is when we put a huge value on making that happen. We're able to run an application, say, that uh, would run, it takes $100,000 a month to run in this environment, and we move it into a federated environment, costs $10,000. Well, that's a real value. That's going to make sense for us to architect and to deal with those complexities and deal with those operational challenges to get up and running. Not on... We have federated applications today, don't get me wrong, but people are man are, are basically force-fitting those into the particular environments. They're always fragile. Fragility is kind of an aspect of that I keep seeing. But if we get into the operational complexity mediation and dealing with these things and how we operationalize those systems, that problem's solvable. And if you look at the, the federated Kubernetes standards, it's been around for a while and it's you know grown and not grown and you know things like that. But moving in those directions is a sensible way of looking forward and how we're going to leverage this technology in the most effective way. And most importantly, how we're going to leverage the technology on our terms using our costs and remove the risk and cost that you know from this stuff, which we have to do to make it successful. And speaking of doing it on our terms, when you talk about the AI, the autonomous AI decision making logic that would automatically determine where a given service or resource should be deployed or should be activated based on what at that time are optimal conditions, both in terms of performance and cost savings. If you think about that being a dynamic part of the architecture, what's interesting to me is that, well, if this is going to be a federated cloud application architecture that encompasses services and dynamically reallocates them across multiple competing cloud providers, that decision-making logic is not going to come from the cloud provider, right? It's something that we have to put in on our own terms and um, utilize for our benefit. And so where do you, where do you see that coming from? And have you seen any progress toward that particular 
layer of, of functionality within these types of dynamic distributed systems. Yeah, I even think uh, there's not a lot of forethought in how they uh, are going to run. There are container containerized systems, and some of the stuff you're seeing from Red Hat and other providers that are that are playing around with this as an architectural level, but there's nothing that is really solid and mature to the point of seeing mass implementation of this technology. So it's living in IEEE papers. It's living on PhD theses that, that I've seen. It's living on, you know, guys like me, you know, writing blogs and certainly wrote about in the book. Um, and so it's conceptually there. Um, but as far as having the real working tools you need to make it happen, that's not really there. Now, I could, mm -hmm. you and I could go off and uh, take a few months and write a federated application that runs on multiple cloud providers, but it would be a force fit, and it probably wouldn't have the dynamic capabilities that were really needed to have it of value. In other words, there would be no self-migration. Uh, there's no failover systems involved. We just don't have time to architect that. Well, to do that, you need the abstraction and automation layers to facilitate that stuff. And while mm -hmm. some of that exists, we have to build it these days. Uh, so we're not at a point where the technology is there to kind of really match the architectural ideas. And, you know, one of the things I'm a big fan of is not, you know, writing checks that I can't cash. And so if I'm going to have an architectural point of view, it, it may be, you know, something that's early stages. And I think it's good that we have this stuff early stages. I mean, the cloud was early stages. We were writing about this in the 90s. And people who are leveraging this, you know, this consumption platform, which is centralized instead of, you know, having individual things. And well, that became something that became part of the uh, part of the infrastructure. But we're not there yet in terms of where the technology is, and it's going to take some cooking that has to occur and probably some leadership that has to occur from the from the hyperscalers to step up and understand that they have to live in a heterogeneous environment and that in many instances they're going to be fragmented technologies. We're seeing some of the hyperscalers that are looking in that direction, but not everybody. And so it's going to mm -hmm. come from the tool providers, things like that, and also uh, – from the developers and builders and architects and themselves have, uh, you know, kind of rising up and start demanding the technology that's going to make this occur. And right now there's not a lot of viable uh, cost analytics that moves them in that direction. It doesn't make sense for the hyperscalers to make this happen because we don't want to run an application on all, other people's clouds. We want to run it in our cloud. So therefore we're not going to build technology and infrastructure to enable that to happen. There may be some third party providers that are providing those capabilities. We're starting to see those emerge today. They're just not a lot, there's not as many application of the technology is not as, as much leadership that it needs to occur around how you do those architectures correctly. Yeah, unless there are untoward influences that may inhibit it, I it, it makes too much sense to not happen. I don't know when it'll happen, but that it's a logical application of, of what an AI um, component can do and I would also assume that with containerization in place, introducing that even after your system is dis distributed and deployed won't disrupt things too much. It would be this dynamic um, agent layer that would be capable of automatically redeploying or, or, or whatever its responsibilities would be. So I know it's science fiction right now, but it, there's so much common sense behind it that I, I hope it's something that, that comes in the near future. Yeah, well, I'll keep bringing it up. We'll see uh, if it starts <laughs> to emerge. I think right now, I think the meta cloud is the low-hanging fruit that people are going to start moving yeah. to pretty quickly. And there's a relationship between the meta cloud and federated cloud applications, Deep. both conceptually and in terms of one applying one supports the other. Yeah, it's cart horse. Yeah, you got to have yeah. one in place, or else you're not. You have no no business running a federated application if you don't have the abstraction automation layer to support it. Mm -hmm.